All right, well, welcome everybody to week number six of our prayer book catechesis. This, um, I'm planning for it to be our final week, but we'll see how this goes. Um, and we're, I'm sure we got some more people that are going to pop in, and that's all right, too. We're on page 293 in the prayer book. So if you got your prayer book, please turn to page 293. Uh, last week, we talked about um, sacramental theology in general and baptism in particular. This week, we're going to be talking about the Lord's Supper. So top of page 293, why was the sacrament of the Lord's Supper ordained? <clears throat> Pardon me. The sacrament of the Lord's Supper was ordained for the continual remembrance of the sacrifice of the death of Christ and of the benefits which we receive thereby. So again, we have the, that two-part answer, right? It's not just the remembrance. That's, that's certainly commanded in scripture, but it's remembrance that comes with benefits. There's something we receive. It's not only remembrance. So what is the outward part or sign of the Lord's Supper? The outward part or sign of the Lord's Supper is bread and wine, which the Lord hath commanded to be received. Notice again that um, emphasis on the Lord's command, right? That's a big part of our sacramental understanding is the Lord's command. What is the inward part or thing signified? The inward part or thing signified is the body and blood of Christ, which are spiritually taken and received by the faithful in the Lord's Supper. So outward and visible sign is the bread and wine. Inward and spiritual grace is the, uh, the body and blood of Christ, which are spiritually taken and received by the faithful in the Lord's Supper. What are the benefits whereof we are partakers in the Lord's Supper? The benefits whereof we are partakers in the Lord's Supper are the strengthening and refreshing of our souls by the body and blood of Christ, as our bodies are strengthened and refreshed by bread and wine. What is required of those who come to the Lord's Supper is required of those who come to the Lord's Supper to examine themselves, whether they repent them truly of their former sins with steadfast purpose to lead a new life, to have a lively faith, that means a, lively, a living faith, by the way, in God's mercy through Christ and with, with a thankful remembrance of his death and to be in charity with all men. Okay, so um, the, the benefits, um, that spiritual strengthening, strengthening and refreshing of our souls uh, by Christ's body and blood in the same way that our bodies are strengthened and refreshed by the bread and wine. Um, that doesn't get into a lot of details and that's on purpose, right? Um, what, what exactly does that strengthening and refreshing look like? Um, we don't always know, but we are assured by God's promise in scripture that that is indeed what we, what we receive. And then what, what is required? Um, examine, ex examination, repentance, um, uh, a living faith, and um, to be in charity. That's why we have that call um, the exhortation, that kind of short exhortation, every, every communion. And then we have the long exhortation at least three times a year um, is, is kind of reminding us what we need, what needs to be the state of, what, what our state needs to be if we're going to receive the Lord's Supper um, worthily rather than um, unto damnation as uh, First Corinthians uh, says. Um, it, it, again, it doesn't get into a whole lot of details. We don't get into a lot of the various controversies that happen. Um, there's some of that hinted at, but nothing gets, um, is really, really ironed out specifically. And one of the things that you'll find um, is that in general, um, the Anglican approach um, when it comes to the sacraments and some of these kind of deeper issues of theology is to be reluctant to go beyond what the scriptures say, um, to be reluctant to be go what's, what's, what's clearly there in scriptures and reluctant to kind of tease out the implications in certain, in certain areas, right? So, um, and we'll talk about this more in the Q&A session next week or the week after. But uh, for example, um, you know, scripture is very clear that, that, that election or predestination is, is, is a reality. So is individual responsibility. We emphasize both of those things. Um, we don't get into issues of um, what is sometimes called double predestination because that's just not something that's explicit in scripture. I mean, and, and you might be able to tease it out logically, but um, 
we don't we don't tend to go there. And so we see the same thing with the sacraments. Um, we, we don't get too deep into the waters and trying to define this. Um, we, we, but but we, we do kind of keep things where, where, where scriptures and the unified church do. Okay, questions, comments on that. I know that's pretty deep and there probably will be some follow-up on that. Matter of fact, I know there's gonna be some follow-up on that in the Q&A. Um, so if, if y'all are happy to kind of leave that, we can leave that until then or we can tackle some of that now. I, I was gonna say, I, uh, I appreciate that not to go beyond what the scripture says, you know, try and uh, create something that's not there. But I, I, ha I receive a devotion every day uh, uh, by Jerry Bridges. He actually died a few years ago. One of the things he always reminds uh, people, you know, in his devotionals, no matter how old you are, we need to be reminded of the gospel. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Remember, Daily. And which, which we do during that time every Sunday, you know, in the, the communion. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's good stuff. I mean, the the, the truth is, we're we're prone to forget the gospel. We're prone to forget those uh, basics, and so um, those need to be constantly before us. Um, yeah, that's that's a good insight. Well, then let's turn to page 294, and if um, y'all need to pick back up on anything uh, from this, we can do that as well. So 294, what order of ministers are there in the church? Answer, bishops, priests, and deacons, which orders have been in the church from the earliest times? Okay, that needs to be qualified a little bit, I think. Um, we do see all three terms in the New Testament. Um, you know, bishops is um, in, in many English translations, it, it's translated more as overseer, which is kind of a literal literal rendering of the Greek episcopus. Um, priest is uh, kind of a linguistic corruption of the Greek presbyter, which is literally elder. So depending on your English translation, it may have um, overseer and elder, and then deacon literally meaning servant, um, you know, and deacon's kind of a trans, transliteration or an Englishifying of the Greek word for servant. Um, not everywhere that those terms are used are, it, it seems in context in the scripture that they are referring um, necessarily to an ordained office. Sometimes it seems that they are, sometimes not necessarily so. And the truth is in the New Testament itself, it does seem most scholars would agree that the terms for um, priest and bishop, um, again, English being overseer or, or rather elder and overseer respectively, are really used interchangeably in the New Testament text. Um, it's really hard to see a differentiation solely on terms in the, in the New Testament text. However, we certainly do see some of these uh, folks have greater authority than other folks. You know, for example, we see the apostles and specifically St. Paul giving Timothy and Titus um, roles that we would very much see as Episcopal roles. You know, they are, they are appointing other elders. That's not something all elders get to do. That seems to be very unique to these guys. Um, they are very much acting as the ruler over those, that group of elders in their respective cities that they're kind of in charge of. And so um, we see functionally, whether in the, in the people of the apostles themselves or in certain of the, you know, bishop, bishop presbyters, you know, elder priests or elder, elder overseers, um, a greater authority than that which is there generally. And um, so we, we, we and, and there's, what that exactly looks like in the first century is certainly very fuzzy. Um, we do absolutely know from the writings of St. Ignatius of Antioch, and I just finished reading a whole bunch of his stuff for my Lenten devotionals um, over the last week and a half or whatever, um, that by the time we're leaving the second century, that differentiation between the offices is firmly established. And um, we see hints of these things um, pretty established within that second generation. We're talking 
Polycarp, um, you know, folks like that, that second generation after the apostles, guys who were trained by the apostles themselves or were trained by people who were trained by the apostles, that sort of thing. Um, and it seems like what we, what we probably have in New Testament times is that most of those roles that we would see residing in a bishop today, and we're ta we'll talk about that in a little bit, those roles, are within the, the 12 apostles themselves, plus a few people that they kind of appoint to do some of that kind of thing, like, again, Timothy and Titus. And we, it seems that within that kind of, you know, sometimes they're called the apostolic men. They're not apostles, but they're the guys that the apostles directly appoint to do some of those apostolic duties. It seems that those are regional. Um, it does seem that they have regional um, authority. So um, Titus being, um, if memory serves, kind of over, over the city of Crete in that area. Um, but we also, it also does seem that there is a bit more of a collegial relationship in, the, in those first two generations between the bishop and the, um, what, would, what we would call now the bishops and, and the priests, um, almost, almost kind of like what we would see with our regional archdeacons. Like they, like they seem to be, you know, our regional archdeacons in, 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 in our diocese um, have a certain administrative role. The difference being is that it does seem that there's a, there's a judicial role as well as administrative um, among those, those that are kind of, those that are what we would now call, call bishops. And it seems that it does seem historically that most likely the major shift happens when the apostles are no longer there in that, um, a certain measure of that apostolic authority shifts to what we now would call the bishops. And that's when we see that the, the bishops and the priests firmly becoming separate offices. Um, but again, it is pretty fuzzy um, in the first century and the beginning of the second century. Um, not at all fuzzy once we're leaving the second century. It's, it's pretty established at that point. So that's still very, very early on. We're talking, you know, a couple generations. Um, an interesting writing about this, uh, just kind of for recommended reading, um, Archbishop James Usher. So he was the primate of the Church of Ireland. I, uh, in um, during the time of King James the first and or you know uh, King James of the King James Bible King James and um, Charles the first, he has a couple of essays on the episcopacy which I find absolutely fascinating and one of them is called um, something to the effect of like the uh, the primitive um, office of bishops or something like that, and the other one is called the reduction of the episcopacy, and in that first one he kind of traces that development historically, as well as could be really discerned, you know, in the 7th, 17th century. Something that he said that I found absolutely fascinating was he makes a really good case that in the book of Revelation, um, the angels of those seven churches are not angelic beings like we would think of today that they're being addressed, but that the angels are the bishops in charge of those major centers of Christianity. Like these are the guys that are really, of uh, the buck stops with them um, among the churches that are in Ephesus, um, Laodicea and all those other places, because those were areas where the church was pretty big and there were a lot of little churches. So it's, it's, it's fascinating. It's not, it's certainly not a silver bullet, but I, I think he makes a really good case. And I think we can make a good case that we do have some sense of a threefold office um, even in New Testament times, even if that distinction between the use of the terms bishop and presbyter, bishop and priest are a little fuzzy in New Testament times. Um, that's probably a good place to, uh, to ask questions before we, we kind of describe the three offices a little bit. Well, that, this might be a little premature, but I, I heard the, the apostle, there's the apostles were the original uh, apostles, the twelve. I, but then, there, that I understand, there's a there's that gift of apostle, and that would be like someone who has overall uh, authority for, let's say, a region or 
and that would be over a, a certain number of ministers and would have that kind of responsibility, maybe even cross-cultural. I've heard that before. Yeah, there's different ways that um, kind of the apostolic office, because we do see in some of the gift lists or some of the, the office lists uh, in Romans, I, I believe is the one I'm thinking of, um, where apostle is listed um, in those, to, you know, to some he gave apostles and some he gave this. And that, that's one of those, and th that's again, you know, we, we don't always see these terms being used super precise in the New Testament. Um, so what is the apostolic office being spoken of in Romans? And probably he's not talking about the 12. He's not talking about adding to their number. Because one of the things that we do see unique among the 12 is um, because they were eyewitnesses to the risen Christ, they've got a role in in developing what we would call, what we would now call the New Testament that other people do not, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, that, and that's, that's, you know, that, that's one of, the, one of the things we recognize unique about that group of men. Um, and then St. Paul kind of added as, as, as being, you know, what did he call himself? One born out of due season, um, you know, that, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but in terms of what is that, that kind of, we might call it a minor, a lesser office of, of, of apostolicity um, that, that is mentioned in, in Romans. Um, I've heard it kind of described in, in, in church planting terms. I've heard it kind of described in more of that regional terms. Um, I think it's, it's kind of hard to tell from the text itself what that means, and which is why it's really good when we're talking to people. Okay, what do you mean by that, right? Um, you know, when we talk about the... Um, the apostolic office of our bishops today, we're certainly not talking about that in terms of revelation, right? I mean, you know, the canon is closed and, it, and that's, that is the way that is, but we're talking about it more in terms of that kind of buck stops here type of authority. Um, but there are other people that kind of think of it more in terms of um, cross-cultural ministry, you know, vanguards of of missionary work, you know, planting churches, that sort of thing. Um, you know, and some people will kind of want to talk about two different kinds of apostolic succession. And I mean, I'm, I'm really not, I think sometimes those, those types of discussions are trying to fit things into a preconceived mold, <laughs> you know, um, rather than letting the text really speak for itself. Um, but, but yeah, I, I have heard, I have heard um, some of those same things, Randy. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I followed exactly. Okay. Well, let's look at those three offices um, here. So, what is the office of a bishop? And so, the office of a bishop is to be chief pastor in the church, to confer holy orders, and to administer confirmation. So, the unique rights, um, R I T E S, that we need a bishop for are ordinations and confirmations. Um, that's, that's pretty, pretty universal in the Western church. I do know among, in, in Roman Catholicism, there are special times when a senior among the priests, like a Monsignor type of person might be delegated confirmation duty because they just know they're not going to get a bishop down there. And usually that's kind of confirming adult, adult converts. So they administer the conversion the baptism, the confirmation, the first communion, all together kind of in that big, big um, ceremony, often at the Easter vigil. But I don't think that's normative even today in Roman Catholicism. It certainly was not at all the case in any of the Western church um, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, trace it on back, way past the Reformation. In the Eastern churches, they do allow priests to um, do their version of confirmation. They would call it chrismation. And the reason there is that they did not want to separate those um, kind of three rites of initiation, baptism, um, anointing at chrismation slash confirmation, um, and then the third one being Holy Communion. They didn't want to separate those three things. They wanted to keep it all together. Um, whereas in the Western church, they didn't want to remove the bishop from that equation but they also didn't want to hamper 
the local ability to baptize and administer communion. And what we really see historically happening here is that there are two different answers to the same problem. And the problem was um, in the earliest days of the church, it was very much an urban phenomenon. Christianity happened in the cities. And so you always had a bishop right there, right? You know, the, the, so um, the, which is, which is why, you know, I, I, we could say that in those early days, a bishop functioned very similar to our regional archdeacons um, with some extra things on top, of course. But as it spread out into the country, um, you didn't always have a bishop right there anymore. So what do you do, right? And so, so the Western church and the Eastern church answered that in two different ways. The way we in the West answered that is we, we kept confirmation with the bishop, but we did delegate the other two um, communion and, and baptisms to the priests with the unfortunate consequence of we did separate the three rites of initiation. In the East, they delegated all of that to the priest with the unfortunate effect that it made the bishop less important in the life of regular parish life. So, um, yeah, but yeah, so we do need, we do need the bishop to, to in, at least for us, to do um, uh, confirmations and to do ordinations. And we would typically have um, one bishop for ordaining deacons or priests, um, at least one bishop. But if we're going to consecrate new bishops, we would, we would almost always have three bishops to do that, just so that we don't have kind of rogue bishops wandering around making other bishops. Um, what about that idea of the chief pastor in the church? Well, um, even though I'm, I'm the rector at All Saints, um, and, and, and that means I am, I am y'all's pastor, um, ultimately the bishop is, is your pastor, and I'm just kind of an underpastor. You know, I, I belong to the diocese. Um, as much as I belong to All Saints, I belong more to the diocese. Um, the bishop has considerable authority um, that he often will not exercise on the parish level because he, you know, he is delegating a lot of that to, to the rector and to the local situation. But, um, you know, the bishop, for example, is completely within his rights. If he wanted to say, you know what? We all need to get on the same prayer book. Um, you 1928 users, you need to get with the times. Um, and so we're going to use that that new Nigerian one from, from several years ago, or we're going to use the 2019 ACNA one, something like that. He could do that. He would be within his rights. Um, he would not do that, but he could do that, right? Um, and we do have in the way our polity runs there is on the, on a certain amount of checks and balances, you know, um, you know, for example, um, the bishop really can't tell you what to do in terms of paying your, your clergy. That's kind of up to the vestry, right? But the bishop can um, de-license a cleric if he's in trouble, right? <laughs> um, or, you know, and technically he, he could totally transfer me at any time if he wanted to. Um, again, in practicality, you don't see that happening very often in Anglican circles and certainly not in our diocese. In our diocese, the bishop tends to get involved when there needs to be um, serious discipline issues. Um, but he tries to, he frankly gives us a lot of chances to shape up before he does that. Um, you know, I, I've been in the loop on a couple of times he's had to do that. And in every single one of them, um, there's years of him trying to um, use the carrot before he uses the stick. Uh, so, but yeah, ultimately the bishop is the chief pastor and, and um, in all things uh, canonically and biblically lawful, he, he is the last say and, and he, and, and we, we owe him um, obedience um, in those, in those issues especially his clergy. <laughs> we especially are men under orders. Um, growing up in a military family, this makes perfect sense to me. I have no problem with this. Um, unfortunately, there's, there's a large history in the American um, Anglican and Episcopal world 
and I'm not sure how much of this is in other parts of the world too, but I know certainly in our country, both in Episcopal churches and in Anglican churches of congregations being functionally congregationalist where, you know, the bishop's there, but it's just lip service. Um, that's not, that ain't the way it is in our diocese. <laughs> and it certainly is not the way it is in our archdeaconry. Um, we're, we're very, we're very clear on those, on those points. Okay. Um, I spent way too much time on that. Let's, let's hit the other two and then we'll open it up for, for questions. What is the office of a priest? The office of a priest is to minister to the people committed to his care, to preach the word of God, to baptize, to celebrate the Holy Communion, and to pronounce absolution and blessing in God's name. So word and sacrament um, are, are the priest's main job. Sometimes we, um, uh, I, I've heard it kind of referred to, okay, you have the ABCs of the priesthood, of absol you know, absol absolutions, um, blessings, and um, consecrating, and in that turn, they're you know really are meaning kind of like communion, consecrating. Um, so that's the office of a priest, a priest, word and sacrament. What is the office of a deacon? The office of a deacon is to assist the priest in divine service and his other ministrations under the direction of a bishop. Um, that's a very vague answer. Um, traditionally, that other ministrations is is very very focused on pastoral care things. Um, you know, visiting the sick and the shut-ins, um, dealing with, um, you know, alms, you know, um, charity, that sort of thing um, is, is very traditionally within, that's kind of the deacon's traditional purview, which goes back to the book of Acts, right? Why did the seven um, men get appointed as what we would see kind of proto-deacons, you know, Stephen and all those other guys? Well, it was because um, the apostles needed to focus on uh, on the word, on, on, on preaching the word, and not get caught up in, um, as they said, waiting tables. <laughs> and so um, that's why the deacons came about. Um, once upon a time, the church had a lot more deacons than it does. In the early days, uh, there, were, there were a lot more deacons than priests, um, and a lot of it was these mercy ministry issues. And you had a lot more permanent deacons. You don't see a lot of permanent deacons anymore now. Most of the time, the diaconate today is kind of a on-the-job training for the priesthood um, to the point where for a while in certain elements of the Western church, the only deacons you had were basically seminarians in their last year of seminary. Um, I, th I think that's a shame. Um, I'd like to recover a more robust understanding of that office. And what ends up happening is a lot of those diaconal duties get taken up by the lay people um, who probably some, some of those folks may have a call to the diaconate, but it's just never discerned because the office is just kind of, you know, we just don't have a robust understanding of it anymore. Okay, so that's the three offices. Uh, qu questions, comments on the offices? Um, the, the three orders or anything else um, we've, we've hit so far. I, I was, I'm glad you mentioned about the deacons as sort of the uh, pathway to, to, to become a priest. That, I guess that's been my impression, you know, that there's a pathway almost, I mean, that's just, but I'm just wondering, is there, are there other vehicles to become a priest besides going that way? Uh, not in our I service. can see the wisdom in it, but. Yeah, I, I'm not sure when this pattern was established, but it's very, very early on. Um, you do not become a presbyter if you have not been a deacon, you know, and there are a few kind of extraordinary historical examples where someone, they wanted someone to be, to, to be their bishop, and he wasn't even ordained, and so he ends up like spending a day as a deacon, a day as a priest, and then they make him a bishop. I, th I think that might have been the case with, um, oh gosh, St. Athanasius, I think. I could be wrong about that. But there, yeah, there's a few folks who, who went that way. But yeah, it's for as long as I can think of it. You, yeah, you always, it is, a, you, you do, the road to the, to the priesthood is through the diaconate. And, you know, the bishop comes from the ranks of the priests. Um, and, and to that point, every priest really does remain a deacon, um, and every bishop remains a priest and a deacon as well. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, that, yeah, 
that's there that that's that is the way that goes yeah well that that's interesting to me because it seems like there's there's a constant process of uh, developing leaders leadership in, in there that. should be anyway <laughs> and, also, and also you know with some depth with some depth yeah. and, sure, and so forth like that but it's really interesting to hear about the bishop too as a pastor and under under pastor you know i, I that's really it it's it's good good to think of for me the bishop as a, as a pastor you know yeah uh and not just an administrator you know i guess or somebody just kind of moves things around or whatever and i think most bishops regret not being able to do as much pastoral stuff as they'd like to i know that's certainly the case for for our bishop he um he certainly has those leadership gifts which make him a good bishop but um I, I frankly don't think he ever, he, I don't think he enjoys the episcopacy. I think he, his favorite times was when he was a parish priest. Uh, Pam, did you have your hand going there? You're muted. You know, a lot of different denominations too, I've heard of, that they have deacons that are um, servants of the pastor. You know, they basically serve the pastor in different roles. So that's what our deacon does is a servant of the people, of, of the priest, correct? And yeah, we have many lay people that you would think could be deacons, you know, I mean, they're leading the lay ministry, the readers, the, you know, worship leaders that, how come they've never pursued that? It made me think about that. You know, like, well, and something, yeah, and that's, that's, that's a good, that's that's a good um, good observation, yeah. um, and and uh, there's a lot of denominations. You know, for example, the Baptists. You know, my my, my I went to, to to a Baptist school for my graduate work, and you know their understanding of the diaconate is while they while it shares that that idea of service, um, there is a little bit difference in that that we we do require a level of theological training and. Um, Kind of formal training for a deacon that would not necessarily be there in those circles, and some of that's because you know who does the deacon belong to? Uh, you know, in a, in a in a Baptist church, it belongs to that local local church. I mean, everything belongs to that local church. That's that's their polity. Um, our deacons belong to the, the diocese as well, um, and in a certain sense, our deacons belong to the diocese even more than the priests do. Um, in, in a certain sense, and again, that's one of those things that is not always properly understood. Had a, had a really interesting conversation with with a with a fellow who's heavily involved in um, the ACNA's greenhouse movement um, a few months ago, and the greenhouse movement kind of does this real grassroots, ground up training of leaders, and it really focuses on lay leadership. And um, so they have a robust understanding of, of a lay catechist. So that's a lay person who can um, even lead a church plant to a certain extent, right? They, don't, they can't do sacramental things, but they're expected to be able to teach and preach and lead those local little groups, especially if they're kind of like um, real organic, you know, house church type stuff, little apartment complex type stuff, par you know, campus ministry type stuff. And I asked this guy, I said, okay, um, it, it seems like functionally they're not any different from a deacon. So why, why aren't these folks getting ordained to the diaconate? And he had a really good answer to me. He said, he said A, we're going to see some of them. They will end up pursuing holy orders, pursuing the diaconate and the priesthood. But um, there's two things where a lay catechist has... What, what, what differs them from a deacon. One is that the deacon, again, belongs to the diocese. He is a man under orders. He is signed on the dotted line. A lay catechist, not necessarily so. He certainly has authority over him, but it's not as, there's not as big of a commitment, if that makes sense, right? You know, and um, th that also means that there's, a certain kind of there's there's more of a mobility there than would be the case with a deacon or the priest. However, there's also less authority there, and so with that authority comes you're you're having to give up 
a certain amount of autonomy, a certain amount of mobility. Um, you're not quite as nimble organizationally. Um, and so, and, you know, and his point was, we really do need both. And I know there's a few people I've talked to in the parish about whether or not they might have that calling to the diaconate. And usually their hesitancy has been either, either the need for um, getting more formal training or, or not really wanting to give up that autonomy. And I completely, I understand that. I, I understand that. But I do think, you know, some of these folks, it might have been nice if we had caught them a little bit earlier, <laughs> you know, when, when they were when they were younger and could could, you know, maybe maybe get sent that way. Okay, I did have a question from Mickey. I need to pull that back up on the chat. He asked um, the uh, expanding on the on the priest duties. Um, okay, so he, he his question was um, that pronouncement of absolution is a priestly duty. But the liturgy doesn't seem to really have a, 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 a real pronouncement of absolution, rather a reminder that sins are forgiven if we truly repent. Um, okay, yeah, that's, that's, that's an argument that we would sometimes hear from Roman Catholics or Lutherans on our forms of absolution. They are absolutely absolutions, but they're a lot less... Um, They're they're not they're not quite as hardcore <laughs> as private absolution in in a Catholic circle or, or some Lutheran absolutions, um, you know. In that in that they really are kind of pointing back more to the promises. They are they are more like Mickey said, um, um, acting as reminders. They still are absolutions. Um, you know, they, they they still are. They're general absolutions, but they are absolutions. Um, even if they're a little bit softer in their language. And um, like, let me, let me open up to the one in, in communion, for example. Um, ba -da -ba -da -ba -da. Okay. So he says, Almighty God, our heavenly Father, who of his great mercy had promised forgiveness of sins to all those who with hearty repentance and true faith, turn unto him, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So the priest is very clearly here speaking on behalf of God, right? He's saying, okay, God's forgiving you, but who, but the priest is speaking on behalf of God here. And so that's, that's, that's not quite as, again, as um, maybe crunchy. I don't know if that's the right term as, you know, the, I absolve you of all your sins, you know, by the authority vested in me in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Um, although we do see that in like, whenever we have kind of a formal private confession um, and absolution right, um, like in the 2019 prayer book, they do use that form. The one for morning prayer is, is even less so though. Um, the absolution and morning prayer and evening prayer says, Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who desireth not the death of a sinner, but rather that he may turn from his wickedness and live, hath given power and commandment to his ministers to declare and pronounce to his people being penitent, the absolution and remission of their sins. He pardoneth and absolveth all those who truly repent and unfailingly believe his holy gospel. Wherefore, let us beseech him to grant us true repentance and his Holy Spirit, that those things may please him which we do at this present, and that the rest of our life hereafter may be pure and holy, so that at the last we may come to his eternal joy through Jesus Christ our Lord. So it's almost like we're talking about absolution without explicitly doing so, but, um, you know, we 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 would see that as still being that that absolution function and part of part of that it being reserved for the priests is that we do not permit deacons or lay people to to make those declarations i mean because we do see them as priestly absolutions um even if they're a little bit softer worded than um, we would have seen, you know, again, a Roman Catholic or some Lutheran circles. And then we have one more that is pretty common. This is the one from evening prayer, which is the almighty and merciful Lord grant you absolution and remission of all your sins, true repentance and amendment of life, and the grace and consolation of this Holy Spirit. You know, again, it is very clearly a declaration of, you know, speaking on behalf of the Lord, even if the priest isn't saying, you know, I absolve you. Um, he, he is speaking on behalf of the Lord. So, um, and, and part of that, I think, comes from a hesitancy to try to peer into men's hearts. Um, and so, 
you know, that, that's, that is more of a characteristic of reformed liturgies versus Lutheran or Roman Catholic liturgies. Um, some would say that's a defect of our historic liturgy. Um, but I mean, it, it seems to me that it's doing the exact same thing, even if it's not quite as strongly worded. Um, that's, that, that, and that's kind of how, that, that's historically how we, we, we answer that as well. All right. Any 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 other any other questions comments on the um, on the the three orders of the church? Father well, Ashley, I wonder if I could just a quick comment. I just wanted to affirm your your description of the lay catechist and the uh, diaconate. I, th I thought that for me, I, I identified with all, a lot of that for my, many years of experience, but. I've heard that, you know, if you have the local and you have the mobile, the mobile, like what you were describing, uh, mobile uh, lay catechists working together, you really have a healthy combination. I've heard that that's kind of an ideal situation. So, yeah, and in some of it, and what we find the lay catechist ministry, you know, being something we see more common kind of on the frontiers, church plants, that sort of thing, um, you know, our our daughter church, um, St. Benedict's, you know, Father, Father Barry is assisted by Jeff Anderson and Jeff is a lay catechist. And we, we very much kind of set him apart as a catechist for the purpose of that church plant. Um, mm -hmm. Will Jeff pursue holy orders? Who knows? I mean, I know he's, he's, he's discerning that. Um, you know, the guy I was talking to, he's now a priest in Houston and he started as a lay catechist. And at the time that was exactly what was needed. But that also helped him in that role in the discernment process as he was moving towards, towards the priesthood. Um, yeah. So we, we do have that available. Um, one of our new vestrymen, he was the only lay catechist in one of the other dioceses for a long time. Um, so, you know, that's, we, we have not had that function at all saints in a while, but we, we may be uh, bringing on that, that veteran lay catechist to do more catechetical things. Um, we'll see, you know, what the, what the yeah. Lord leads. Um, but, but yeah, we, we find it especially helpful in church plant situations. Right. When um, yeah. our, our archdeaconry is probably going to do a plant in New Braunfels within the next few years. Mm -hmm. And most likely that will be led by a catechist and then um, kind of assisted by the other archdeaconry clergy as, as we can. Very good. All right, I'm going to read these last couple of prayers for the Office of Instruction, and we'll conclude unless anybody has further questions or comments. Uh, 294, and the minister shall add, the Lord be with you and with thy spirit, let us pray. Grant, O Lord, that they who shall renew the promises and vows of their baptism and be confirmed by the bishop may receive such a measure of thy Holy Spirit that they may grow in the grace, in grace unto their lives and through Jesus Christ our Lord. Grant, O Father, that when we receive the blessed sacrament of the body and blood of Christ, coming to these holy mysteries in faith and love and true repentance, we may receive remission of our sins and be filled with thy grace and heavenly benediction through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And then we conclude with the grace from 2 Corinthians. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with us all evermore. Amen. And so in those last two prayers before the grace, we, we, we do see kind of reiterated in prayer form um, the purposes of confirmation and then receiving the Lord's Supper and remembering that this is really in the context of um, preparing people for confirmation and reception of the, of the Supper. And so that is the end of this class. I see a hand, hand from George. Father, I just a real quick question. Uh, having grown up in the Episcopal Church, uh, there were, I remember a couple of, of men in our church who were deacons, but not on a path to the priesthood. And the term then was called perpetual deacon. That was the official name, perpetual deacon. Is that term not used in the Anglican Church anymore? Um, you'll hear it either perpetual or permanent. Okay. Um, and, and, and those are very much unofficial terms um, in, in that I mean, we don't really... In, in terms of ordaining people, make a differentiation between um, permanent slash perpetual deacons and what's sometimes called transitional deacons. 
Um, the, um, in, in our diocese, there is a path to the diaconate that, that is where it's kind of expected that it's gonna be a, a, a permanent or perpetual diaconate and not quite requiring the same level of education. But it's very clear that, it, that if you're taking that path, um, you're not gonna wake up one day and say, oh, now I'm called to the priesthood. Let me get ordained six months from now. Um, not unless you're gonna go back to school. You know, they're not gonna use that as a, as a, as a shortcut, um, which sometimes that kind of thing happens, right? <laughs> so, um, but, but yeah, that, that, term, that term, you do, st you do still see that term. You probably don't hear it as much just because we don't have very many, <laughs> which is unfortunate. You know, that, that is very unfortunate. Okay, thank you. All right, well, I will see you all later on, uh, Sunday or, or otherwise. And um, we will pick up next week with the Q&A. So if you have any, um, I, I received a few, a few things from folks and that's gonna be super helpful. But if you have some questions and you have not submitted them, do so, so that we can uh, get them in there. And, I, and I, again, I promise I won't embarrass anybody. We'll, we'll, we'll um, so um, there are no stupid questions in that all the questions are, are not stupid. <laughs> you, are, you already put me under pressure, Father Isaac. I've got to write something, I think. <laughs> well, good, good. That's going to be great. <laughs> all right, God bless you all. I'm going to end the recording. <laughs>